The following message was presented during the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministries 2018 Prophecy Conference season. Now here's Paul Pierce with a message from Matthew chapter 25, The Talents Distributed. So we're looking at the talents distributed from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. If you'll turn to that, we'll touch on that in just a moment. And just a reminder here, this is a parable. We know that a parable is simply a story that is told in order to relate a spiritual truth or spiritual truths. So stories are important. Jesus used that in his teaching ministry, of course. And we've, you know, a parable can be uh, a heavenly story, or excuse me, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, however you want to put that. But nonetheless, it's a story. And you don't want to build doctrine on it or a theology. And you don't want to stretch it too far, but it certainly illustrates something. So this morning, before we go into this story, I have a story to tell you. Back in... And there's a point to it, by the way, just so you know. And you're going to wonder in the middle of the story, go, where is he going with this? Back in 1966, I was in fourth grade. And in fourth grade, you know, Steve the other day talked about botany. Well, I'm going to tell a little botany story here. Okay. In fourth grade, Miss Larson was my teacher. And we were learning about botany. And so we had little cups with dirt in them. And she was going around with little brown, shiny bean seeds. And she was distributing to each one of us, going around the class, and we get our bean seed. I had that bean seed in my hand. Remember, fourth grade boy. Look at that. And she says to all of us, now, class, we're going to plant this. Don't be putting it in your ears or your nose or anything like that. (laughs) See, I I probably don't have to tell the rest of the story. (laughs) How this bean seed between my fourth grade fingers, hovered underneath my right nostril, I am not sure. (laughs) All I know is, do you know how far you can shoot a bean seed? Do you know how far you can? It shoots a long way. So, under my nose. She's not even done passing out the beans. And that bean went right up in the, and it got stuck way up in here. I'm sitting at my desk and I'm going, She sits down at her desk, and I'm going, what do I do? I, go, mm. I get up from my desk. I walk up to Miss Larson. I said, Miss Larson. She goes, yes, Paul? Um, uh, she goes, yes, Paul? I said, I have a bean stuck in my nose. <laughs> oh, Paul, go to the bathroom and get it out. Well, anyway, I go, and I get it out, and I plant the seed, and it grows and all this stuff. In the cup, it grew in the cup, all right? (laughs) So I tell you that little story before I launch into the parable for this reason. I heard Miss Larson say, don't do this. Now, a couple years ago, I happened to run into Miss Larson. I was doing some work. I work as a general contractor during the week while I'm raising support as a missionary with Friends of Israel. So I'm working during the week on the same street Miss Larson lives, knocking the door. And she says, oh, yeah. And I said, Miss Larson, I'm Paul Pierce. She goes, the bean. She remembered the bean. (laughs) And here's the funny part of it. She's, sadly, she has dementia. And she's, she remembered the bean, of all things. And she told me, she goes, I never should have told you guys to not do that. Just put the, I blamed it on her. It's her fault. (laughs) So, my point to this is, when we hear a story or we open the word of God, it's so important that we listen with an intent to obey. I listened as a fourth grader, but that's as far as it went. And that, (laughs) you know, there are many other instances I should have learned too. But anyway, listening with an intent to obey. Paul would write to Titus in Titus chapter 1 verse 2. He talks about the knowledge of the truth in accordance with godliness. In other words, the knowledge of the truth that translates into living godly. So even as we are sharing about the Olivet Discourse, and we know the context, we'll get to that in a moment as well. In fact, we talk about clarifying the context here. Uh, Have you heard context this week? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Context, context, what? Context. 
Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Bruce, for that one. All right. We want to clarify that. And here's a couple ways to do that. When we are looking at this, this parable, this story that Jesus uses, we understand, and this has been helpful for me, when we look at all of this, we've heard how Jewish it is. Well, here's a simple way to put it. It's a parable that addresses a Jewish question. That's from the beginning of chapter 24. It addresses a Jewish question asked by Jewish disciples of a Jewish rabbi who gives a very Jewish answer. And so that is the context of Matthew 24 and 25. We know that. It's the parable, the story that is addressing the tribulation period and those Jews living in that generation prior to the return of Christ to establish his kingdom. You've heard this before, but it's a little refresher here as well. In the text that we're going to read this morning, I believe that the Lord or the master and the man in this text represents the Lord himself. And the slaves of the man, I believe, represent ethnic Israel or the Jewish people. And I'll explain that. We'll unpack that a little bit more as we move along here. Also, the talents that are de being described here are not spiritual abilities. You know, um, parables are so often abused and misused out of context teaching. But we understand the talents here are really probably an amount of money, uh, silver or some valuable uh, monetary value that way. So that would be the context of this particular parable as we, as we look into this. Now, let's read this parable, uh, starting at verse 14 of Matthew chapter 25. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who had received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master." Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gathered, gather where I sow, scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the, slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Well, as we unpack this here, we want to first of all take a look at the entrusted uh, responsibilities here. And the master's distributed talents were purposeful. He had a purpose for them to be distributed. And of course, in this parable that Jesus is telling uh, his disciples and communicating to them about what's happening, what will happen in the tribulation period, we make note of a few things here. First of all, the master and his slaves, we'll take a look at that first of all. The master and his slave, Kurios and Dulan, the, they were slaves of him. They were his possessions. And the disciples would have had no issue with this because in that day, slaves were common. To be a bond slave, and that's really the word that is used here, a bond slave is one whose will would be bound up in the will of his master. 
And these bond slaves were often given great responsibilities and some freedoms and such. And they weren't just the bottom of the wrong slave. They had earned that right. And so these bond slaves were an important role in the family at that time, in those families. So the disciples, this wouldn't have been out of the ordinary for them. So we have a master and a slave, the kurios and the doulon, slaves of him. They were his possession, and the text clearly does talk about that when it, uh, when it talks about his slaves. The man in verse 14 called his own slaves. They were his possession. But also the distributed talents here, we find that he shared what was his They were his possessions to share and distribute. Again, it's not unusual for a master, a kurios, to entrust something to his bond slaves because they would know that they were expected to take good care of that. It was his initiative. It wasn't the slaves. We see that he took the initiative to do that. He called his own slaves, verse 14, and entrusted his possessions to them. So that gives, but it says here, each according to his ability. And you think about this. So to the one, he gave five, to another two, and another one. Each according to his ability, the text says. So as we look at that, each one had a different capacity. Now with our kids, our seven kids, you know, we, they had chores to do, things to do, and all of that. We would entrust, Carolyn and I would entrust to our kids things that they were capable of doing. Now, if you were to uh, pack a kid down with way too much to do, become discouraged, can't do it. So if you took the, the slave that only got one, but gave him five, well, obviously he was not responsible. He was not capable of that, to handle five. If you gave the man, the, the man who got five, gave him one, that would be almost demeaning to that man. So. The master gave according to the ability to the capacity each one of them had to serve. He knew that because they were his slaves, his own possession. Now, as we move along here in this, we understand that uh, as those bond slaves would have recognized their responsibility being given something, we go to the text again and we see here the contrasting responses as each one was given those talents, that amount of money here. And I'm going to describe these a little bit more. I really do believe from the context of this, Jesus is explaining about this master and slaves, his own slaves. I believe these were Jewish people alive during the tribulation, will be alive during the tribulation. The faithful are those who are the believing Jews during the tribulation period. Those who come to recognize Christ as their Messiah. They believe. That I think these slaves represent those Jewish believers. On the other side of the, the chart here, the faithless or the unfaithful slave, I believe these are the Jewish people that are not believers. They belong to the master in the sense that with God, they're his chosen people. They belong to him. But there are those in Israel that are don't believe in those that do believe. And I think the faithless are the unbelieving Jews. That's what they represent here. And the faithful are those who believe. And the text, as we move on in this, we see here, first of all, how did they respond? The one that was given five, as we look at the text here, it says, verse 15, to the one he gave five talents, to another two, another one, each according to his ability, and went on his journey. Now, remember, these slaves didn't know where he was going from the text. They didn't know how long he was going to be gone, but it was going to be for a period of time. Immediately, verse 16, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more. So we find this interesting word right here, immediately, is in the text. The faithful, believing slaves took what they had with the five, and immediately, they didn't waste any time, went out and traded and invested, and came up with five more. And it says here, in the same manner, the man who had received two did the same thing. Now, with that, these two people, the two slaves with the five and the two, in belief, I think this is what it represents, in belief, they were choosing to honor and bless their master. Um, Many times, those who were the slaves and how they responded to the, excuse me, those who were the slaves, responding to the master, 
the good slaves were reflecting the very character of their master. And so here they wanted to honor and bless their master. They received something, they went out and took care of it. On the other hand, we have the one, he received one, and it says here, verse 18, but he who received the one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. He went away. I, I think that's significant. He, he leaves. And, and he leaves the scene, and he goes somewhere, digs a hole, and he puts it in there. Why? Well, he doesn't know when he's coming back. But in unbelief, I would say this represents the fact they're choosing to act selfishly and fearfully. And, and we'll explain that a little bit more as we unfold in the text when there's a, an accounting. Why did he do this? Well, Reynolds Showers in his book, uh, The Sign of His Coming, says apparently he believed he lacked the ability to gain more talents and feared if he tried, he would lose what he had. Well, that's a very gracious, that's Rennie, isn't it? <laughs> and that may very well be. It, it's a parable, it's a story, and what he represents there. Others have suggested, well, this one slave in unbelief did not how long the master would be gone, went out on his own, fearfully and selfishly decided, well, listen, who knows if he's coming back? I'm going to take this, I'm going to hide it away, and if he doesn't come back, it's mine. If he comes back, I'll give it back to him. But he had no belief and trust in the master. At least that's what's represented here, it seems to be. So apparently, for, well, for whatever reason, in the story that Jesus is telling, and the truths about the Jewish people alive during the tribulation, this represents those who do not believe, do not trust, they have no thought down the road. In fact, Thomas Constable, he's a retired Dallas seminary prof said that the slaves of God who have a heart for God and his coming kingdom will sense their privilege, seize their opportunities, and serve God to the maximum extent of their ability in the tribulation. Those who have no real concern about preparing people for the coming kingdom will do nothing with their opportunities. I think it's a great summary right there. I think what's represented in the parable in this story that Jesus is telling of these bond slaves is there were those who believed and acted in accordance with that and reflected the character of their master. The one was one who did not believe and cared nothing about the opportunity that was given him. And take note that in the parable here, the master gave each one of these men equal opportunity differing uh, amounts, five, two, and one, but each one of them were given equal opportunity in a very fair way to do something with what was given to them. Well, now comes to the settling of the accounts. Verse 19, now after a long time, the master, the kurios of those slaves came and settled accounts. Settling of accounts, we might call it facing the music, pay the piper, whatever. Now, in school, I can tell you that there were times when I had to have accounts settled with the principal, <laughs> more than once. No need to tell those stories, but I do. There's one when uh, I have three, uh, two other brothers, and we shared a bedroom, and there were times that, you know, you go to bed and you're just, ha, 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 whatever, you know, talking, laughing. And my dad would be on the living room, sitting in his recliner, watching the news or whatever. And we'd get yucking it up in the room. He'd go, boys, quiet down. I'd go, oh, yeah. You know, as boys do. I might have been a fourth grader at that time, too. I don't remember that. <laughs> anyway, after a while, he said, boys, settle down, go to sleep. Oh, yeah. You knew when there would be a settling of the accounts. Because you see, when you heard the recliner go down, you go, you, go, <gasps> you knew it was getting close. But not quite close. So you pushed just a little further. And really what was the telltale sign that there would be a settling of the accounts is when you heard the recliner go down and the belt would come out of the belt loops. And you knew. <gasps> And then came the footsteps. There would be a settling of accounts at that moment, <laughs> facing the music. 
it's not always a negative thing. Sometimes there is this settling of accounts in a very positive way. We'll see that here in the text. But there's also a negative side of that as well. So as we look at this, we see, first of all, with the faithful, the believing uh, slaves, when they came, there was no fear of accountability. They were anxious to come to the master, right? And explain to them what they did. It says here, verse 20, the one who had received the five came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. This is a good accounting. The settling of accounts, the slave came and said, and he was excited. There was no fear to come and say, look, here's five, five more. And the master, when he says good, basically he's communicating, you have done what was expected of you. And you fulfilled that. Wow, you were faithful with that. And I think you have a message here about the coming kingdom, that there would be that reward in the kingdom. They've been faithful, and God would bless them. And so I believe here, in the sense here, the master's response being hopeful and sobering. The hopeful side is just this. The master who represents the Lord here, we understand God blesses faithfulness, does he not? Throughout scripture we see that. A principle of God blessing obedience and faithfulness. However, on the other hand, there is another accounting here. And when we read the text here, down to verse 24, and the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed, and I was afraid. Went away, hid your talent on the ground, so you have what is yours. This kind of reminds me of Genesis 3, 8, after Adam and Eve have, had rebelled against God, and God came to the garden in the cool of the day, and where were Adam and Eve? Hiding. Because of guilt. Now, how often, just human nature, when we're in trouble, when we're guilty, we want to hide it. And then, when we're caught, we respond by doing what? Blaming. Accusing. And that happened in the garden too, right? Oh, the, the serpent told me, oh, but the woman you gave me goes on like that. And we try to hide things. We'll accuse, we'll blame, and we'll be angry about it. I just think what you've got here, what's being uh, portrayed with the faithless, unbelieving slave, the consequence was the removal of the talent destined to weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because he'd been disobedient. He did not honor his master at all. There's a sobering side of this. It's very solemn. And what we've been hearing, Clarence shared this the other day about that impending judgment that was coming. And as we read this, it is just a parable. It's a story. But when we understand the, the, uh, the scope of Scripture, and we all realize as believers there is a day of judgment coming. It is impending. And Jesus gives a warning here, I believe. Both he gives a hopeful view that God blesses obedience and faithfulness. But also there is the settling of accounts for those who are unfaithful. Do not believe and act in accordance that way. They don't take it seriously. There was judgment that was coming. That's a sobering reality out of all of this, facing the music and realizing what was going to take place. And they're the, destined to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. This isn't just uh, a believing person who's being punished. That particular phrase refers to those who are uh, living and persisting in unbelief and rebellion against God. And that's the consequence, eternal. Well, we want to look at the context for application here as uh, we look at this and understand what's going on. There's a clear, both a clear need and a purpose to grasp something in this parable. And I think we look, first of all, there's an underlying truth. And I'm not saying these concepts are right there in the text, but anytime we read in scripture, I think there's something for us to take note of. 
And first of all, as the master in the account, I believe uh, is representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Godhead, there's some things that I take out of this. When I'm studying scripture and I'm teaching and preaching, I look for how God is displayed in the text for us to take, uh, pay attention to. First of all, we see the faithfulness of God to his word. And I would put it this way, God says what he means and he means what he says. And all of scripture tells us that God cannot, will not lie. And so what we have portrayed here in the Lord in dealing with the believing and unbelieving or the faithful and faithless slaves, we have Christ communicating truth. And the underlying truth here is God is faithful to his word. Absolutely. He cannot and he will not lie. We can take him at his word, absolutely. But secondly, we see the righteousness and justice of God, don't we? We see that God deals righteously with man throughout all of scripture. And I think it's portrayed in this particular account. God is fair. He gave equal opportunity. There was faithfulness, God blessed, or in this case, the master blessed the faithfulness. And the master then also brought about that sobering reality of judgment to the unfaithful, to the unbelieving. Now with that comes another part, and I think we see God's grace and, and mercy in all of this. Think about how much time God gave the world when, uh, when Noah was building the ark. 100 years. Was that enough warning? Yeah. Now, parents, you know, your parent, your grandparents, you raise kids. You would warn them, right? In graciousness. Sometimes warning might have been a little shorter time period, but nonetheless, you would warn them. And you would give them opportunities. Oftentimes it was, look in my eyes, make sure there's a connection point, you know. And you, you walk through that way. But it's important to know that God's grace and mercy are seen in this. If you turn over to Isaiah chapter 42, I think this is displayed here very, very well. God doesn't spring anything on anybody. He doesn't act out of, I mean, he, he acts in accordance with his character. In Isaiah chapter 42, verses 8 and 9, says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. God in grace and mercy always warns us. He doesn't spring it on us. He, warns, he gives ample warning. And he did with the Jewish people. And so we find here, and this is what uh, Chafer said in his systematic theology, knowledge of biblical prophecy qualifies all Christian life and service. And my emphasis here, by it, the believer comes to know the faithfulness of God to his word. Isn't that true? God is faithful to his word. We can count on that. Absolutely. Now, here is an application. I would call this in context for Israel during the tribulation Jesus is giving a response to a Jewish question by a Jewish audience, and he gives a Jewish answer to them. And that is just this. Though the parables of the talents has relevance to every generation, the Lord was still speaking directly about the generation that will be living just before his return in glory. So here we go. To the believing Jews during the tribulation, continue believing. Don't give up hope. Keep watching and faithfully serving God will bless. I think there's a message there to them. And we've heard this from what Mike was sharing last night and before, that the need to watch, be prepared. We see the message leading up to this. And here in this particular parable, it says, keep on faithfully serving. Watch, be prepared, be diligent, keep on serving. To the unbelieving Jews during the tribulation, if you persist in your unbelief, here's the message. Judgment is real and judgment is coming. Trust in Christ as your true Messiah. And I would say this beyond that to anybody living in the tribulation, Jew and Gentile. The message is place your trust in Christ. But the message in the, in the parable, in the story, is simply 
be prepared, be faithful. God will bless. But if you don't, if you persist in unbelief, judgment is coming. How about in principle? There's an application in principle for you and I today as we look at this as well. I think, first of all, we see that there, we need to see and trust the very character of God. Throughout the whole of Scripture, we see the attributes of God in His holiness. This great and awesome God who is faithful, trustworthy, righteous and just, gracious and merciful and loving. We can trust Him. What He says, He has done and will do. We can count on that. But we need to live in anticipation of the Lord's return. In this age, during the age of the church, we are looking for the rapture. When Christ will snatch us up to take us home to be with Him. Now I realize this is not the text, it's not about the rapture. But for us, in principle, we can take this to say we need to watch. We need to be prepared. We need to live diligently and faithfully. And by the way, we're accountable for what God has given to us. Are we not blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ in Ephesians 1.3? We are. And there will be a day we will be held accountable for what we've done with that. To be faithful to God. Believe there's an urgency to share the gospel. Be ready always to share that message of hope. Build relationships with Jewish people. I tell you, Clarence, the other day, your message about that judgment, and it hit me so hard to think, I have a Jewish neighbor. But I also have family members and people that need to hear the gospel. Do I believe judgment's coming? What am I doing about that? I need to act in accordance with that. I need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that they would come to know the Prince of Peace. Well, Theology that does not touch the heart, that does not resonate with your inner spirit so that it changes you, has failed at its task. In other words, we can have a system of belief, but if it doesn't do anything with us, it's just knowledge. Ron Rhodes, Bible Prophecy Answer Book, said this, As he did with Moses, God has also revealed future things to you and me from the pages of prophetic scripture. And like Moses, we have a choice to make. We can either live for the fleeting pleasures this world has to offer, or we can live in light of eternity, choosing purposefully to live God's way as we sojourn through life toward the heavenly country. We can live now in the light of then. We can do that, and we better. Folks, we need to open the pages of Scripture and listen with an intent to obey. We need to take these words, these precious words of God, prophetic words, but also words of living today. We believe him. The message of the parable to the Jewish people is, be prepared. Faithfully serve. Don't lose hope. But if you persist in unbelief, judgment is coming. We need to care about that. We need to be ready to share the gospel now. What if we're sharing the gospel with a Jewish person today that will be one of the 144,000? Wouldn't that be exciting? Don't know that, but uh, will we listen with every intention to be obedient to the word of God? I think there's a lesson in that. There's something about the, the tribulation period that needs to be applied that we understand and that for us today. 